Hey gang, if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know last year I went all in on saddle hunting and all my saddle gear comes from Tethered. And I wanted to tell you how I made my decision to use Tethered as I didn't just haphazardly put my faith in their gear. If you know anything about me, I, I kind of go through a painful process of researching things before I kind of take the plunge. And that was the exact case uh, here whenever I was thinking about moving into saddle hunting. So first for me, weight mattered. Um, the saddle, you know, the Tethered saddle is the lightest around. It weighs in at a whopping 15 ounces. There's also the other benefits of being able to hide behind trees away from deer, you know, being able to get into trees in and out of, you know, areas super quiet and super stealthy. And I go through all those benefits with Greg uh, from Tethered and Podcast 102. So if you haven't listened to that, you might want to check that out. Uh, second, they thought through literally everything in the full package and accessories uh, of for saddle options from years of being DIY saddle hunters themselves. So whether it's platforms, ropes, they just know what will work from years of testing and years of uh, hunting out of saddles. And most importantly, they're here to help. Um, there's a bunch of ways to get into saddle hunting that are somewhat unknown if you've never tried it. And this was the case with me last year as I didn't know anybody who saddle hunted it and didn't have anyone near me to try a saddle and kind of see if it was something that was a good option for me. Uh, so this was me specifically last year. And Tether can help with this from everything from choosing the right size saddle to how you place your feet uh, for different shooting op or shooting scenarios while you're in the saddle and different climbing options. You name it, they can help. If you're interested in getting into saddle hunting or want to learn more, go to tetherednation.com. That's T-E-T-H-R-D-N-A-T-I-O-N.com and follow them on YouTube. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Truth From the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 135. Today we're diving into another DIY report look back series with my buddy, the bow hunting fiend. So stay tuned. All right, all right, all right. What is going on, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you all are doing well out there. Hope you're getting a chance to enjoy a little bit of this nice weather that we're finally having here that feels like fall might actually be be right around the corner. I can do with this, you know, in the mid-70s versus the 94-degree sweltering heat with uh, with humidity. So good weekend to get out into the woods, <clears throat> finish up any, you know, food plots or anything that you have going on because the weather is, is being kind to you. For me, there wasn't a whole lot of... Uh, Deer work again this this past week a little you know the the typical shooting my bow making sure I'm staying staying uh, on on top of that but I did manage to get out and check two cameras this past weekend I kind of broke my own cardinal rule which you know you've heard uh, Greg and I talk about on this look back series which is just trying to stay off your cameras as much as possible you know and if you're going to go in um, make sure you're doing it with some rain in the forecast or even on a rainy day but I have two pieces where I have yet to pull a camera one of them is brand new to me. And, uh, I have no idea what's, what's there. It's a close piece to the house. And, uh, I, I needed to get out and just, and, and check them just so I know what, what's going on in those pieces. Cause the truth of the matter is, is next weekend I'm not, or this coming weekend, I, I I'm not free. I have a, I have some traveling to do for some family stuff. And so then the following weekend would be the first weekend that I would have again to get back out in the timber. So that'd be what, like the, I want to say it's like the, maybe the 10th of September. I don't have a calendar in front of me. I can't remember exactly what the, what the date would be, but it's getting really close then at that point to let me look here. Oh, it'd be the the seventh, I guess, of September. And at that point, I'm getting a little uncomfortable as to how close I'd be getting to the season opening because for me on these pieces particularly, the season opens on September twenty first. Um and so I'd like to have a little bit more than a two week buffer on these pieces without me traipsing around in there. So I had to just kind of make a uh make a make a quick decision as to whether or not I was going to jump in, check cameras. And I, and I decided, you know, there is some rain midweek, um, in that it was probably better for me to go check now than check later. And so I hopped in there and, and gave him a check, which I'm glad I did. The one piece that's closest to the house, there's not anything really to speak of on the camera. A lot of deer activity cameras in a great spot. There's like a little, you know, a little corridor essentially of, of path of least resistance travel around the edge of this other swamp that I, that I found. Um, and it seems that that is kind of like the highway for these deer, um, so got a lot of deer pictures, some bucks on there, but just, there weren't really any, any mature bucks, nothing really to write home about or to speak of. Um, so, you know, it'll, it'll be a spot that I'm able to jump into in the mornings before work. It's really 
really close to where I live. Um, so probably be able to fill some doe tags there. And, and who knows, you know, I'll keep kind of watching the camera as a, as I'm hunting that area and see if there's any, you know, any biggins that happen to show up. And then I made my move into the swamp because there, I wanted to hang one more camera in the swamp and I had a camera in there that I needed to check and, uh, to validate that, you know, one of the big deer from last year has, has returned. And, uh, I got in there to check it. And, uh, unfortunately I, I had hung the camera in a spot where I got, um, a lot of, uh, false triggers because of the leaves moving. Um, so that was kind of disappointing. The batteries were dead. Um, I got about 7,000 some odd pictures of blowing leaves. It did manage to catch like a deer or two as it happened to pass through as the camera triggered. Um, so that was my bad. So I ended up pulling that camera you know, and then removing or moving that camera to a different location to where I'm hopefully not going to get, um, you know, get, get those false triggers. So it was a little bit of a disappointing card pool. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. I, the thing is with that spot, I don't know that I necessarily need the inventory to know that there's deer there. Um, just because I know from, from last year that they, they do like the, to hang in this spot. It was more, um, validating which deer were actually going to be there and, and, and what their kind of, you know, summer pattern was, if you will, because it, since I'm able to hunt them, you know, in this spot specifically earlier, um, you know, or mid midish September, I can still kind of capitalize on a bed to food pattern. And I hung cameras in there late last year, so I didn't really get a good sense of what any of the patterns were. Um, I just knew that there were good deer in there. Um, so this year, my hope was just to actually get cameras in earlier so I could start to maybe pick up on, on some type of pattern. Cause I know I'm close to their bedding. I'm just not sure exactly what time they're getting in and out of there. Um, so I hung another camera in there. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we have better luck with this, uh, with this pool, but I probably won't check it until I hunt it for the first time. And, uh, you know, that'll be based on whenever I get the right wind. So with that, uh, I'm not going to belabor this up front a whole lot. We've got a really cool show for you today. We're doing uh, another session of the Look Back series with my buddy, uh, Greg Litzinger, uh, the bow hunting fiend. This has been, you know, a lot of you folks have, have messaged me on social or whatever and, and have been really enjoying this uh, this DIY report mini series. I've enjoyed putting it together. We're going to have some coming out throughout the, the course of the year. Um, it might be a few weeks before we get another one, uh, another couple sessions pulled together. Um, but this session is actually, we're, we're talking a lot with, I think the entire session uh, that we do a look back with is uh, Aaron Warbritton. Uh, of course, Aaron's from the hunting public prior to that, you know, I think when I did this podcast with him, he was still working with, uh, Bill Winky at Midwest Whitetail. He and Zach were still there. Um, so this was maybe pre hunting public and, and it was right before I think they made the move into the hunting public. So, uh, but we talk about a lot of stuff. This is really, you know, what we were focusing on was, um, was, was public land of course. Um, and we're really kind of talking about in this, in this session specifically, how, how he goes about scouting public land, you know, when, when he's killing deer and you might say, well, that's kind of a silly, you know, silly thing to talk about because it happens in October, and November. But the reality is that he goes into some details and we, and, and then Greg and I kind of dissect the idea of like, you're really killing your deer, you know, in, you know, February, March, you know, or, you know, January, February, March, when you do your postseason scouting, um, is really when you're putting the puzzle pieces together and, and doing all your learnings to kill your deer in October, October and November. And so Aaron talks a little bit about that. And then, um, Greg and I kind of discuss it as well. And then we also talk a little bit about mapping, you know, those guys, you know, Aaron, and those guys jump around on so many different pieces of property. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, them hunting in, in Iowa or when they're doing their deer tour nowadays, um, you know, they're going to a lot of new pieces. And so they're having to rely heavily on, on maps, um, to kind of, you know, I guess, uh, decrease the size of the property that they're going to have to try to scout because they're walking into some pretty large pieces. Um, and so we talk a little bit about how they're using maps. And then of course, I think the one thing that they do really, really well, and it, you know, is it would be akin to, you know, maybe say, you know, uh, Dan Enfold or the, the, the DeQuistos is, you know, they do a really good job of hunting hot sign. You know, they're, they're, they're really good at not, um, I don't want to say overthinking or outthinking themselves, but they walk into an area and they find good sign. It's like, they're not, they're not bashful about setting up on it. It's, you know, even if they had a goal of getting to, you know, further back into the piece or something like that, it's like, if they run across hot sign, that looks good. They'll set up and hunt it. Um, and so we talk a little bit about that as well. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get this session kicked off and thank you all for listening. All right, this next segment is with our buddy Aaron Warbritton from The Hunting Public. I'm sure all you out there know of him. Uh, what he's talking about here is a little bit what we've touched on in the past, which is kind of how he's 
hunting public land, specifically how he's getting on deer in public land, um, when he's killing them, quote unquote, and how he's using uh, cameras to kind of as a tool to assist him in that. So let's listen to the segment and we will discuss. Really, when uh, when we're killing those deer, I mean, we're, we're killing bucks on public in October and November and December. But uh, that's when we're shooting them, I like to say. When we're actually killing right. them is in the late winter, um, spring, and early summer. That's when we're out there figuring them out. And and the best way to, to pattern a, a buck on public land is almost a year after the fact. So what I like to do on, on public land, instead of running a bunch of trail cameras and constantly checking them, and trying to keep tabs on a specific buck, we'll we'll set up cameras in areas out there and, and hope that they don't get stolen. Unfortunately, some of them do. Right. Even if we lock them to the trees, that's just going to happen out there. Um, and there's some things you can do to prevent that, but, but uh, I can get into that later. What we do with our cameras is we'll run them deep in a bedding area, way back in somewhere for the entire season, and we won't we won't even pull them until after we're done hunting. And then we'll take that intel from that year. Maybe there's a couple bucks on there showing up doing a certain thing. And then we'll go in there and scout that property really hard during the off season in the winter, shed season, and then in the, in, in the spring, looking for bedding areas, looking for travel routes, trying to figure out where that buck was living, what he was doing when he was on those cameras. And then we can come back in the next year if by chance he survives and we pick him up in the summer or early season on the camera, we already have a decent idea of uh, what he'd done the year prior. And as you follow them, you know, um, year to year, and as they mature up to four or five and six years old, you're able to sort of connect all those dots from uh, the years prior. So off season scouting and really year round scouting on public is the number one thing. All right. So that was Aaron talking about his or their, I guess, the, I guess it's more the hunting public approach, yeah. you know, at this the time, method. whatever the, their method, the HP yeah. method. When mm. I spoke with him at this time, the HP wasn't around yet. This is when they were yeah. still working with Midwest, you oh, know, working OG with, with Bill Winky. Um, but Aaron at that time was still doing, they were still doing a lot of public land, land hunting when they weren't, yeah. when they weren't filming. Um, but this is something that we touched on a little bit ago. And I think it's in, important you know it's I, I think when you talk to you know i forget who it was that i was just listening to and they were talking about this and they were talking to them about killing mature deer and killing big deer and essentially what they were saying is is that if you're trying to kill a big deer right now you've already lost yeah you know unless you get lucky i mean you can get lucky you can get on a deer that you get on like a bed to, <laughs> the wrong guy for that uh, one yeah I know, right <laughs> some people can get <laughs> yeah, lucky talk yeah. to the wrong dude yeah, but some people can get lucky right um i'm on know, that six year luck plan you yeah. know <laughs> you know but you, you, maybe you find a deer during the maybe your season comes in early enough and you find a good deer that's coming that's on a steady bed to food pattern and you can catch him you know super early in the season and, and capitalize on it but that's at least the folks that I know, the guys that I know and hunt with, like that's few and far between. Um, what more so the guys that I know, like Greg and, you know, the HP guys, my buddy, you know, Chad, some of these guys, it's all about killing that deer in two or three years what ago. And Wilson. And Wilson. Yeah. yeah. He's our esteemed colleague. Yeah. <laughs> he's totally left you hanging. Wilson's like, hello. Hey, hello. No high hello. five for me. <laughs> Yark. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but uh you know using that that two to three years worth of data that you have on on a piece that yep. kind of tells you what the what the deer are doing yeah, i know that's kind of what your approach has been it's uh laws of averages i guess is probably a, a good term to use and i don't you know i don't hunt specific deer i just try and shoot mature deer right uh, i don't i don't get into hunting a specific deer because i think it kind of takes away from the whole right um everything and plus, I've really never seen a deer enough time to say, hey, I'm going to shoot that one. Right. You know, I mean, so, but, you know, the way they approach it is it postseason scouting. Yeah. And once I, I wanted to up my game up, we were talking the way over here, once I wanted to up my game up from shooting 100 deer to something bigger, I didn't shoot anything for three years. I had to let 100 deer walk, which was so hard because it was like, oh, it's, it's like shooting fish in a barrel, you know? Right. I was just in tune with them. And once I started really diving postseason scouting, putting in more work in in February, you know, March and April and May uh, than any other time, uh, 
it took a few years, but you know things kind of played out, and right. it seems to be for me like a property. I, I wanted to, you know, on average two or three years till I actually can get an idea of what maturity are doing naturally on like that what, property. Yeah, yeah. With, without the aids of you know outside of the rut, you know, you got that small window of scrape activity. Right. But even that's inconsistent at best because you don't know what's on. You know, I want to know. I use cameras like they do. I set them all year. You know, two or three years for a in a bedding certain, area, yeah, 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 and see how they're coming, what time of year they're using it. You know, because you think, oh man, early season is going to be fucking insane, mm-hmm. and nothing. <laughs> I yeah. mean, nothing. And then you're like, wow, November twentieth, so weird and strange, you know. And then you're like, because you find all these active beds, you know, they're you got the rubs in it, but then you got the cameras in the bedding, and in January it's nothing but does. Right. So when I'm scouting these areas, I'm finding all this this hair. Oh, there's rubs and. Well, there's a small window in where a buck was actually using. Them. Yeah, in, yeah, in the middle of November, so he doesn't necessarily live in there. So I'm trying to shoot a target a deer in October that might not be in that certain area. You know, he's somewhere else in private or most likely right. private. You know, right. So, I mean, I'm you know how they use cameras and, and scouting is very similar to what I do. Right. For me, it's just you know, um, I started. When I started putting time in in the off season, I'm, and I'm not saying that if you do your scouting in the summer that it's not helpful, right? Like, not saying that at all. If that's the time that you have to go out and learn something, by all means, go learn something. I just, I just feel like I think what they're saying is, is that that you're you're killing this year's deer, and you know, like you were saying, like March, yeah, April, you're, you're killing and, and in your May. postseason scouting, but yeah. you're you're shooting them in Shoot, October, right? And f- what I've noticed is as I I started making more of a an effort to find the time because you know times we've mentioned it a hundred times here the three of us it's like you know it's hunting is third on our list of priorities because we are family guys and jobs and stuff like that but i pri- i've begun to prioritize at least locally getting out and scouting in march april and may as much as i can and really kind of probably focused on it more the past two years than i ever have and all of a sudden like of uh, no surprise I'm figuring out where bigger, yeah. like I've had the biggest deer, and I've not killed one of them yet, right? right? That's the next step. But I've located the biggest deer that I've ever located inconsistently, yeah. you know what I mean, on public pieces, yeah. right? Um, and he mentions, you know, hanging cameras and, and, and bedding. I think one of, the, one of the challenges, at least for me, is a lot of these public pieces that I'm hunting, it's not like maybe in the western part of the state. There are some larger tracks, but like I'm more finding smaller tracks of public that are slightly overlooked because it's not, 800 acres right and so it's getting overlooked because people are like oh this is just a little 60 acre chunk and it and it's a swamp or something like that or just like really crappy you know not next to any agriculture so people don't really want to pay it any attention so they may not actually be betting there so that's the one difference for me is the excuse me is going back to what we were talking about a few segments ago is that instead of putting the cameras in in bedding in those areas because I might not actually find the buck bedding on that property, Mm -hmm. right? Because they might not be bedding on that property. Find doe bedding, right? But what I'll do then is I'm looking for terrain features that they're going to consistently use. And then I'm hanging my cameras in those places and then I'll let them out Mm -hmm. until basically run the full season until their antlers drop and then I'll I'll pull them. And then I'll go back and look to see who was where and look when over, were they there? All, all over those 20 pictures in an SD card. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> well, it's like as soon as the season starts and you pick your bow up, in your your mentality switches, you're like, I'm no longer scouting, I'm killing. You right. Know, I'm hunting. My season I'm never ends, harvesting. so how can it start? Yeah, exactly. Ooh, ooh. My season never ends. But it's like, <laughs> dear you. Yark. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> But it's like guys. People are listening, guy, going like, "What the hell are yeah. they talking about?" It's like, it's who even like, cares yeah. anymore? Yeah. He's a youngin, so right. The you know, uh, the hipsters, right? <laughs> Yarksters, Yarksters. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go Wilson. No, I'm just saying, it's like guys in our area. They're they're like, "Oh, I bumped a deer going out, but it was a small six. Well, that small six was the deer you're going to shoot next year, mm-hmm. and right. now you just educated you educated them, them. Yeah. and so. If you're bumping deer, be it does, fawns, or anything on the way out or in, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Right. right. But it's, and it's tough because some areas, like I hunt, I got to get out like 25 minutes before the sun sets because otherwise I can't get out. Like, I made a mistake where I'm in my tree. Like, long, I had a coyote call and I'm like trying to get the deer out of the field because I have no way to get out. But those. Just walk out. 
Yeah, I'd say, what's up? <laughs> I'm her. <laughs> but like, I'm hunting. I'm in an area where I can hunt, find a specific deer, and I'm hunting that specific deer. But it doesn't change my mindset on all the other bucks that are traveling in that area because those are the bucks I'm going to hunt the, the next year. Right. Mm. I think that's a, a big thing is just... I understand what you're saying with like when you're bumping a deer, you're, you're, you're doing it wrong. I think especially if you're hunting in season in a known area, right? I think the one thing that I've started to maybe adapt a little bit more, and I actually picked this up from Zach, was that no, you don't want, and I would be curious about your opinion on this. No, wrong. you don't want to, <laughs> no, you don't want to bump deer, right? That's not your goal, right? And it's, you, you don't want to do that if you can help it. But one of the things that he mentioned, and it never really dawned on me and, until he said it, but he was like, that's the best intel you can possibly get on a buck. If you know, if you think you know where a buck's living and you can get in close to him and, and you accidentally bump him, you don't want to do that, right? But that is a huge piece of intel for you because well, I think it, he operates under the mind that well, if you're deer bumping will, in daylight, yeah, and you can visual, but if you're bumping exit and entry well, in the dark, yeah. then you don't know what the hell you're Yeah, bump. that's when it's really tough. You know, okay. or you, 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 like you said, bumping deer, it, it's not the end of the world. But if you're hunting the same piece and you bump deer on a consistent basis, you you need to change up your <laughs> your axis and <laughs> yeah. go zig when you should have zagged or something. <laughs> it's time to make a change. You know, but like right. in, in Zach's thing, when you bumping big deer, it's it's fine. Most people think it's the end of the world, and it's not. You know, it's right. over. I yeah. give up. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Right. You know, and it, and it's not because that deer was better there for a specific reason, and he got away. Right. That means reinforced uh, that yeah. that spot was working yeah so go back you know and there you go boom you know and it's a bedding area you might not have specific bed but it's a, a bedding area that you can use but in the, right like i said at 2 a.m if you're if you're bumping deer you know it, it, that's not good or 3 a.m whatever your your entry mode is right you know i got a couple early spots so right. when i say 2 a.m I, I actually mean it Wow. To your listeners, not just saying that because it sounds cool. Right. It sounds it. cool. Yeah, it actually does. It. It's just a benefit <laughs> that it sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like I hunted a new spot. I got in. Um, I and I shot two does. I was like really pumped. Like all these does. I'm gonna whack. I shot two does. I was there super late, processing, cleaning deer, getting them out. I hunted two days later, and it was like nothing had changed. Mm -hmm. Nothing had changed. Well, that's the deer I shot this year. That that six pointer. Um, I shot him out of a bed, you know, and the next day I was just, just still hunting. It was windy. Still looking for him? Yeah. No, my deer <laughs> died in sight. So. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Right yeah. <laughs> you are right Yeah. You see me shoot today, so. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, there was actually another buck bedded, a smaller six pointer. It's actually on my, uh, I think I put it up on YouTube, a buck bed in the same exact bed. I shot my buck out of him. And I literally sat in that buck's bed. I shot him. I sat in it, laid in it, looked at him, what he was doing. I'm like, all right, this is what they're doing. You know? So, I, you know, if I didn't kick that buck up out of that bed or shoot him, I probably still would have went and sat in his bed and everything else got mm -hmm. intel like Zach said. And I was all over that place, gutting, you know, he only ran like yep. 50 yards, but dragging it. And Ricky came up. The next day, this deer was bed, literally in the same exact bed. And there's people listening to this that probably just won't even believe that. Yeah. They're right. like, there's no way yeah right i see things about bumping deer and you're never going to see that deer again but well. yeah i mean i think it depends on you know how much pressure that deer has had that season yeah. at that point has he had other negative experiences in that bedding area yeah you know did he because i mean did he smell you and see you and hear you and plus you know what and, I mean? it's and like, like in, in wilson's defense you know, he hunts in small wood lots they're going to get bumped out from time to time that's you, they can't escape that because yeah. first of all they grew up in that it's nothing yeah. new to them like oh there's well there's, i have some spots i hunt specifically because i know they're gonna get bumped by like the school bus and the kids yep. running mm -hmm. off the school bus and they get bumped out mm -hmm. they'll run 150 yards You're 35 minutes hour later they go back yep you know and i've watched them. they just stand there or they sit down and watch yep. kids are gone they're gone back mm -hmm. you know yeah so you know when we say, you know, you're you're killing your buck in March, April, March, April, and May, you know, I, I don't want to be misleading here in saying that, you know, because one of the things is I think when people do their scouting in the winter, you know, they prioritize, don't over-prioritize what you learn during that time, mm -hmm. right? Because you also don't know when that sign was made, especially if it's a new piece to you. You know what I mean? It's like when you find some rubs, was it made when they were shedding velvet? Was it made when they were, it was 
pre rut? Was it made during rut, post rut? Like you don't know when was that scrape made? When was it opened? When did it go cold? Did it reopen later? You know, it's like there's all. Does he like tacos? Does he like tacos? You know, does he like guacamole or (laughs) not? You know, it's like, you know, so I don't want to mislead people in thinking that like that's the end all be all. I think it's the marriage of of laying the groundwork of like knowing that deer like to use an area. And then it goes back to the three week thing that we talked about before. How are they changing over the course of the season? And where is the hot sign being laid down? Because you found that sign, right? But when when were those specific areas hot? And that's what you want to find. That's what. You know, that's why whenever you hear guys like, you know, yourself, you know, and I'm, I'm pointing to Greg for those out there listening that can't see Wilson. the point, you know. You can point this way too, okay. No. Okay, here we go. Do this. <laughs> you know, whether it's you or whether it's Dan or whether it's, you know, whomever, right, it's 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 the combination of what you learned previously and that whenever you're hunting, you're also always scouting. Yes. You know what I mean? And you're looking for Running that and gunning. Sign. Running and gunning. Just being um, obser- observant. Like, you're, you go into the woods with people and you... You walk out and you're like, did you see this or did you see that? They're well, clueless. They're, they're totally clueless they're so to what's going on. focused to my ladder I'm going, I'm going to my tree. You know yeah, what I mean? That's I like it. Well, and when you're trying to kill a specific buck, that's even it gets even worse because then you forget about everything else. Everything else. Yeah. I wouldn't know about that. Sorry. Right. I can't. <laughs> I can't relate to that. I can't relate to the single <laughs> buck thing. Yeah. The, uh, but I mean, that was something that you and I were, were talking about. When, as we were driving over here again was just a lot of driving we did do a lot of driving we did like a lot a, of talking in like a 20 minute drive yeah. <laughs> I rode quietly by myself yeah. stuffing your face with it <laughs> right <laughs> but uh, we were you know discussing that where as we were talking about hunting more terrain and, and making that more of a priority because again mm-hmm. not hunting the same deer year over year you know at least I'm not able to in most of the places and that even I'm hunting like certain areas you know we talked about the, the three window and even what Aaron was saying about using the intel from the camera there's you know yearly scrape areas yearly rub areas you yeah i got some spots it's you know every year it's like i'm gonna get it and each year it changes it's never the same it's close it's within that last week of october sometimes it's october 25th sometimes october 31st you go into a section of woods i mean i've gone there there's no rubs all right i'm gonna go hunt somewhere else I won't hunt there the next day. I'll go back the following day and the place is tore up with rubs. And it's like, I missed <laughs> right. it. And it's like, because there's, there's so many rubs there. It's like, there has to be some daylight activity because there can't be 60 rubs in, in this little, you know, corner All of this made field. between like... Yeah, in know, the cover of darkness. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. it's impossible. It's like, it, it, this, this is going to like 10 years. It's like, sooner or later it's going to happen. And right. it's such a high traffic area. I don't even want to put a camera in it because I know it's going to get stolen and that's going to make me angry. Right. So it's like, and it, it, I've had so much time invested in it. I don't even want to put a camera in it because it's kind of cheating. It's like, right. all right, I started this, you know, a Sands decade ago. Camera. I was like, yeah, I'm going to. It might take me another twenty years, but sooner or later, I'm going to kill. I mean, these are big rubs, big marsh deer. So right. there's some monsters out there. It's like I want to do this on my own. You know, I don't want no yeah. surveillance, electronic surveillance. I just want to do this, you know, because i kind of we've you put know. your time you've put your time in yes. you know what i mean and it's like and at this point to be honest it's like i don't know how much a camera would even help you at that yeah. point like i know when it's happening you just gotta catch that and it's literally it's a 24 to 36 hour window when most of these rubs happen it's like right well i mean have you ever <laughs> is it did you and i'm sure you have but like have you been able to kind of map it back to like a weather event or nope. anything like that it's just bucks on their feet moving for getting ready for the rub hmm. and it's it's and it, it doesn't when it's hot you know, usually it's if it's hot, I I can almost pretty much bet it's it's nighttime activity. Right, right. You know, and and it's always some years or, or more like this year. Those three distinct rubs, like big rubs, they all had different characteristics. So those three good deer coming through this one section. I hunted it for a day and a half, nothing. I took like two days off, and I came back, and it was like I didn't see a deer or nothing for <laughs> right. you know, my little all day sit. And it was hot, like nothing came through. Then you see a squirrel, and it's like. And I come back and rubs were everywhere, scrapes everywhere, and it's like, so it turned on. Yeah, and it's yeah. like I missed it, and and then it just it's dead. It's I'm dead. It, it's just they, they're coming through there, catching because there's, there's doe bedding, and they're just coming through to this little, it's a overgrown, be I guess soft edge, it's overgrown field, you know, and then the woods kind of just goes to this bedding, and it just gets tore up, right. you know. And I know guys that hunt it and say the same thing, you know, and I know some guys that killed some really good deer there. I actually found that spot, you know, by eavesdropping, <laughs> listening to people talk at a store, hey. and I'm like, I know that was. And the guy's like, dude, there's rubs are there, and that one corner, and I'm like, I know that corner. Yeah, I was like, 
I know that woods, and there's only a few corners. So I checked it out. I was like, holy shit, there's shrubs everywhere. Right. So, and the one guy was like, yeah, I, I pulled a 140 off there, you know, uh, right. you know, big sub, mature eight, the late October. So I'm like, oh. So I'm not the only one doing it, you know, right. hunting as well. So, right. but it's, you catch those moments if you, uh, little sections of time. Yeah. It, it, rubs when they go hard horn there's certain spots they rubs or apple trees with scrapes little community scrapes yearly you know rubbing yeah. areas rubbing stations posts whatever signpost rubs right you know scraping areas and then it, it, everything's just based on time and that's yeah. where cameras can definitely help out with the time mapping the time, <laughs> time stamping yeah. time yeah exactly time I, stamping those because i had rub a rub line i hunted for years and i decided to put a camera i never seen a deer nothing worth shooting because giant rubs, bullshit. It's a little buck. <laughs> yeah. Fucking right. it up at night. And I'm like, hmm. And I mean, these, some of these trees are like, you know, from years of rubs, it's yeah. just a year and a half old, you just know, deer. tearing it up. Just tearing it up. And 20 minutes at one tree, just yes. on all sides. Exactly. <laughs> Working all around the tree. And I'm like, yep. wow. And you look at the rub, you're like, how does, you know, a deer that big, but like I said, he, he works his way all around the tree. So you think it's massive things and he stands <laughs> up and goes down. Rack, yeah. It's like, yeah. And it's nothing. It's a, a nice deer, but not, not want to shoot. So I'm like, I literally spent like four years hunting that rub line outside of a doe bedding area for nothing. First of all, it was all nighttime activity. Right. And it wasn't something worth shooting. So it's like, hmm. Camera oh, would have been helpful right there. Yeah. Four years ago, camera would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the, the, the net net here is that when we're talking about, you know, killing your deer in March, April, and May, it's like, yeah, you're seeing a lot of sign, which is great because you should be doing that inventory and that, but it's really that coupled with the understanding of when exactly was that sign laid down yes. and then using tools like a camera to figure out who was actually laying, yes. laying that down, especially whenever you get into bedding areas where you don't want to be intrusive and, and, and you let that kind of sit over time, over Use those the cameras year. as tools, you know, yeah. like we talked about earlier. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they're they're not a toy. They're a tool. That's right. It's not All a right. cat toy. <laughs> it's not catnip. Yeah, it's a cat right. tool. So I think that that uh that wraps up that segment, and we will move on to the next. All right, we're joined here again by, uh, or we're listening to a segment with Aaron Warbritton of the Hunting Public, and what he's talking about here is really taking a a piece that maybe you may maybe you're unfamiliar with, or a new public piece, and how you go about starting to. To break it down and really from a topography perspective, like when you're doing your online scouting, where do they start from that perspective to get started? So let's uh, listen to the clip and then we'll discuss it. All right. So when you're when you start doing your scouting, how much, especially, you know, you know, when we're talking about public land, how much of what you're doing even before you get into the timber is based on on maps and looking at, at, at topo maps and, and, and stuff like that? Are you guys getting into that as well to start to really kind of pinpoint areas? Cause <clears throat> I know, you know, that the public land areas you're hunting are probably tens of thousands of acres, right? And it's just, yeah. you, you could take a lifetime to try to scout all that. So how are you guys kind of narrowing down your choices before you get there? And are you? Well, that's a good question. And yes, that's the first step. Um, you've got to find, um, a good resource online to, uh, to scout, um, cyber scout as we call it and, and pull up Google earth, Google maps, um, powderhook.com is a great resource. A lot of the state agencies, the DNRs and, uh, conservation agencies and so forth have maps on their websites that, uh, actually show you property borders and boundaries and stuff. I think Onyx maps also sells a chip system that you can put into your GPS and computer where you can see all of the updated public land boundaries. That's the number one thing, being able to see those boundaries so online so that you know which land you can and can't hunt, obviously. Right. Um, but uh, the next thing it, that we do when it comes to scouting is we'll check off all the areas that are easily accessible. So say, for instance, you've got one big block that's 5,000 acres and uh, roads are surrounding that block and uh, there's a few trails going through it like bike trails and and whatever else i'm going to go through that map i'm going to mark all those parking lots i'm gonna i'm going to mark those trails any like ag fields that have access trails leading straight to them i'm going to locate all those on a map first and i I won't necessarily ignore those spots but i'm not going to pay uh, attention to them firsthand when you're scouting 5,000 acres and you're trying to find a place to hunt, uh, you want to deduce that down 
to uh, as small uh, of an acreage as you can before you go in to scout. Because it's impossible to scout 5,000 acres in just a couple of trips. I mean, it'd take you 10 years to figure it out. <laughs> right. So you look for you look for the highest um, pressured areas. And those are, I mean, those are very predictable. People are way more predictable than deer. And deer pattern people, for sure. So uh, you look for those areas, look for those trails, and mark them off, and then you start to look for your typical terrain, you know, your funnels, your, your bedding locations, uh, your thick areas, your habitat changes, um, food sources, so on and so forth. You, I mean, you don't do anything different there from an aerial scouting standpoint that you would on private land, except for the fact that you're targeting those pressured areas first and you're basically marking them out. So back to my 5,000 acre example, you have 5,000 acres there. We may, we may only be scouting on two or 300 acres of it right. and just going from one spot to the next until we find the, the location where no people go and the mature bucks are there most right. of the time. All right. So I think, you know, during the course of this, uh, DIY session that we've got going on here. Um, we've, we've danced around a lot of, a lot of what Aaron kind of talked about from access to terrain and, 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 and things of that nature. But here, what he's you know really kind of, I think getting at is, you know, the question really being, you know, if someone's starting out on a piece of public and maybe they don't know much about it, you know, where do you begin? Right. Mm-hmm. Especially when you're talking about some tracts of land that might be, several thousand acres or whatever where do you where do you get started he mentioned a couple things of how he marks off places that he's not going to pay much attention to and um you know and and things of that nature so for you like you know how are you kind of approaching a new piece of of ag land you do you take a similar approach or similar and um uh approaches are very similar except on some of the easy access points i think we touched on this on the last podcast or podcast before that some of these Easy access points. There's good bedding usually. It could, not usually, but there could but be good. Be. Yes, yeah. there could be good bedding nearby where a buck is watching that parking lot or that you know, that trail in. So I don't necessarily overlook those areas. Right. I'll look. I'll overlook the ag, not overlook you know um, mature hardwoods for the most part, but that are flat. Mm-hmm. Um, even if there's food, I just it's I, I'm I'm focused on terrain. You know, and, and bedding. Right. Food is, uh, I would say, secondary because food constantly changes, especially in ag. Right. It's constantly rotating. You know, if it's corn one year, beans the next. You know, how those deer use that piece of uh, property is, is different, but terrain's always going to you know dictate deer yeah. movement yeah. in one way or another. So, habitat and food will change over time. Yes. Food more frequently. Yes. Habitat more yeah. slowly. Yeah, and pressure. You know, will, will constantly different. You know, change, but Deep cuts don't change, right. points don't change, saddles don't change. So right. I'm more of a topography hunter, and I try and find bedding located off that. Like I said, I'm not a big food hunter. Right. Um, I'm actually not really interested in food until I actually locate big buck sign, you know, and, and some good beds, and then food is way down on the list. Right. Um, you know, so, but yeah, there's you know all very good points what Aaron, Aaron talked about, but um, I don't necessarily over you know think anything's overlooked right and i think you know he's he's making some generalities yes. for for people to understand like well if i'm going to start where do i start yes. right and i think those are some really good rules of thumb and i think what we're saying is is that you know you can nuance this a yes. little bit you know to make sure you're not um you're not missing an opportunity yes. right because i think you know I, I think this becomes really critical it's i look at it a couple different ways right if i'm scouting my local public lands right um depending on how big they are right i'm close to them so i may look at places that i typically wouldn't look at if i were traveling somewhere right because i have more time i can invest more time there because there might be a little spot even though i know maybe that it's easy to access and it might get there might be hunters there at some point it still may be worth me looking at because it might be a puzzle piece I need to hunt exactly. a deer somewhere else, exactly. right? I might hang a camera there because I might want to know, going back a couple episodes, you know, that we, or a couple segments ago that we talked about hanging a camera because I really want all the data there because I want to start to backtrack and yes. figure out where else is that deer possibly killable, right? Yes. And so, because if there's going to be pressure there, there's going to be a, there's going to be a, a secondary 
kind of scrape mm-hmm. line potentially yeah. that's going to happen once the pressure happens. And I want to start to figure out where that deer's starting point is. So I might use that to my advantage. Yeah, or it could be like like doe bedding. Like most people go into an area that they'll find the rubs and scrapes and they'll hunt early season when if you say you run a cam or you hunt it a few times, that might be a late season spot that bucks cruise new is late season bedding because it's just the you know, the sort of thermal cover that's mm-hmm. around, you know, or pressure somewhere else. They habitually bed in, in this, you know, they yard up, I guess. Right. Uh, so to speak so them small spots are actually great spots you know and I, I think you and i've we've talked about this numerous times the best spot i ever had deer wise you know biggest i mean i shot end up shooting a big deer never found it but literally everybody parked and walked right by this yeah. little overgrown field it was you know maybe 150 200 yards everyone to go deep and that spot halloween was amazing right the day before halloween the day after was insane and then it was nothing there's right. a three-day you know, two to three-day window you know it was just sh- un- unbelievable right and uh, i mean in th- the three years i hunted it i've seen so many big deer in you know day walking and actually big deer i'm trying to climb down out of my tree and i got giants walking underneath me and it's like and it's like where did they come from they're just like magically right. fell out of the sky <laughs> somehow but Right, you know, some of them small wood lots can can be great, but that's just a, a time thing you learn over a course of time. Right, because I think what Aaron's really kind of driving at is for like a person who's going to have some limited time. Yes, right. It's like you got to prioritize your time, mm-hmm. right? And that, for me, that's why like what he's talking about for me really applies to when I go out of state and hunt. Because yes. I typically, whether I'm going to Ohio to hunt a new piece or like this year I'm going to Iowa to hunt a, hunt a new piece, you know, I made a trip out to oh, Iowa, spent two and a half days scouting, so I wasn't going to be able to cover the entire yes. 25,000 acres or whatever. So I had to kind of look on a map and say, all right, where are the parking areas? Let's just take a half mile circumference mm-hmm. around the parking areas and know that that's probably not where I want to be. Cause anyone who goes in is yes. probably going to make it about that far. It's a little different in Iowa because there's low pressure just in yes. general. Right. So it's like, you don't have to play it quite as safe necessarily as you do in, in Pennsylvania or New Jersey, but I'm still trying to look at getting beyond where a typical hunter yeah. is going to go to. And then beyond that, what are my terrain features that I'm going to want to focus on? And then I'll go to those places and scout those yeah. and spend and, my time there. And like you and I talked uh, as well, and I, I talked to Rick up in Long Island about it, is you have to play to your strengths too. Like I think we just mentioned this a little while ago. Don't yeah, a change couple your segments t- ago yeah, about me changing up my tactics. Yeah, don't change your t- yeah. If you're comfortable, if you're a food, like I, got, I know friends that hunt foods, you know, Bo. He's a big big woods food guy. He's always he f- looking he's, for the food. Yeah, yep. I, it doesn't work for me. You right. know, I, I I just scratch my head like it it doesn't make sense. I got guys in South Jersey that focus on food, that focus, they follow the ac- acorn and stuff like that, and they kill really nice deer. It doesn't compete with me for right. some reason. I I just don't. I've never been able to make it work for me. Right. You know, so when you go out of state and, and you're even just out of your area, out of your comfort zone. Hunt how you're comfortable. If you've had some success in, in one form or another, you know, on a, a few good deer hunting a certain way, try and take that at, with you because that's your bread and butter. Right. Going out of state sometimes isn't the best time to, I'm going to try new tactics. <laughs> right, right. Because, like, not only is the terrain and, like, the habitat and, like, the area kind of unknown to yeah. you, but then you start throwing in, like, unknown new tactics, approaches methods, or yeah. whatever, where it's like, okay, now I really don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, and I'm just throwing shit against the wall and hoping something <laughs> sticks. You know, <laughs> And sometimes <laughs> that's, that's you know, it's, that's needed, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. You know, right. like, you got to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. And some people, their their strength isn't map reading. Right. You know, and I got friends that, that can't read a map to save their life. Mm-hmm. But you put them in the woods, they can find deer. Right. They just, that is, they, they don't have the mental capacity maybe or, or the desire to, to scout. Some people just learn maps. differently too. Yep. You know what I mean? It's like some people were visual spatial people where it's yep. like visual things make sense to them. Yep. Right. You so give them a look. top of map, they don't understand it. You give them an aerial photo, like, ah, and they get it. And it's like, it's the same fucking map. Yeah. yeah, but it's just changing the color scheme of it. Yeah. And it, it makes all the difference. Them. Yep, yep, yep. So I think you know. Yes, I think everything Aaron mentioned here is correct, and I yes. think I think this is one of those instances where no matter where you live, what region yes. you hunt in, this is an effective approach yes, exactly. to try to figure out how to find some of the best hunting True. on a piece of public land. Yes, it, it definitely follow his advice, um, and you'll you know it'll 
should pay off. It'll put you in. Side. It'll put you in a good starting spot. Yes, too. Yes. Not going to guarantee because I mean the second part of this is I think is what we just talked about a little <laughs> bit, right? Is that you need to be kind of doing this in March, April, and May yes. to kind of set up your game plan. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, and then with that, you'll have a better understanding of what you're up against. Think about the pressure, what your access points are, where the easy access is. That's the areas that hunters are going to most likely gravitate toward. So now you can focus on areas outside of that, yes. right? And then couple it with your in season as you're hunting, like your hunt scouting, right? And finding where that hot sign is. So you're running now gun. putting the piece together, running gun. <laughs> the way you're putting your pieces together, as far as I saw this sign in March, it was laid down this time of year because I'm just now seeing yes. it. That means that's where you want to be, mm-hmm. you know. So, all right, I think we covered this pretty well, and I think Aaron covered it really well. Yeah. So, not not a lot to add there. So, I think we can move on to the next segment. All right, this segment we we're still uh, uh, with Aaron Warbritton here, and what he is talking about in this segment is, you know, hunting hot sign or how hot sign plays into setup, especially on pre scouted, you know, pieces of uh, of public that you might be on or just pre scouted ground regardless of private or public. And then also some overlooked uh, sign that he feels is one of the most overlooked and maybe one of the most important pieces of sign that uh, that people misread or don't use. So we'll hear Aaron and then we'll uh, discuss. How much does hot sign play into where you're going to ultimately set up a stand location versus inventory or prior year knowledge that you have? How much does hot sign play into that? Well, um, in most situations, we're going in areas that we have previously scouted. So, if we see, for example, a rub line or a bunch of scrapes or something at the tip of a bedding area, close to one of those trees that we're wanting to hunt, we're going to be pretty optimistic for that spot because we know that a a buck of some size has been using that particular bedding area often. Now. A lot of folks, I mean, here in Iowa, we got, we got a lot of bucks. Um, we got a lot of deer period and right. the public land hunting, hunting is good. So, uh, they leave a lot of sign, even the year and a half, two and a half year old bucks. I mean, heck, they probably leave more sign than the mature bucks do. Right. So you really got to be able to determine, um, the best kind of sign to be reading. And most folks look at rubs and we do that and scrapes. Um, but another thing that, that I've started doing more this year and paying attention to is tracks. And that, that is probably the most important sign that a big buck leaves for you to look at. Uh, a huge track can only mean one thing. And obviously you need to be able to, to check out that track and be able to tell if it's sliding in the mud or if it's you know, good hard ground, flat surface, if the deer's running, if it's walking. But if you find a good flat spot, for example, and it's got fairly good consistent soil, and you can tell that that deer is, is walking by looking at the track, and you can if you look at enough of them, you'll be able to start measuring those tracks, you know, and and I promise you, you can tell a big difference between you know, a four or five year old buck's track in most situations than you can with a, uh, a young buck or a doe, you know, just, just by the way, those tracks set up and, and, and they're all different. I mean, they're, as you, as you know, I'm sure you can look at one mature buck that's five years old, that's huge bodied with tiny antlers. And the next one has a small body with huge antlers, you know, same goes for tracks. So they're, they're not all created equal, but for the most part, mature bucks leave big tracks. All right. So we heard Aaron talk about, you know, we've alluded to in a couple different segments, Greg and I have about, you know, how hot sign plays into, running you know, gun. running gun plays into, uh, <laughs> and people are probably so yeah. tired of hearing us say that because I've been saying it. Um, you know, how, it, how it plays into your ultimate setups and how it influences where you're, where you're going to hunt. And, you know, and I'll just kind of start and then Greg jump in, but you know, what Aaron's talking about, you know, or I think what, let me put it this way. I think the trap that a lot of guys get in, and we talked about a couple of segments ago, is which is like you go out and you do your kill a buck in March, April, May, and we keep repeating that. And people are probably sick of hearing us say it, but it's like the honest truth, right? It's like you're going to kill your deer in the winter when you're doing your scouting. And then hot sign plays into that because that's when you're putting the live puzzle pieces together about when that sign was laid down specifically. And that's, you know, in, in the times of year you should be hunting in those specific areas. Um, I think a lot of folks do sign – 
or do sign, yeah. Do their scouting <laughs> to do find sign. their sign. <laughs> do sign, man. Um, and earmark a tree or a place that they want to hunt. Now, if you have historical information on a property, by all means, if you got a spot that's dynamite and is usually dynamite, but well, yeah, sure, hunt it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But I think a lot of times, and I'm guilty of this too, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I have really screwed the pooch last year on a on, on the possibility of a really quality animal for Pennsylvania last year by not, um, by not living this idea. And, you know, essentially, you know, I had a spot that I had picked out. I liked it. I saw some really good deer from that, from this tree. I had made an observation while I was in the tree, got down, went and assessed it, found all kinds of hot sign. Like I found a primary scrape area that was just tore up. I found, a bunch of rubs that still had shavings on the ground and it was super windy, which meant that rub was made probably that night mm-hmm. you know, before I got into the tree that following morning. And I had a destination spot that I wanted to get to because there was a tree that I wanted to hunt and I bypassed that hot sign to get to that tree. You know, and that's a little bit what Aaron's talking about here is that, you know, yes, you make your plan, but that hot sign needs to be kind of taken into <gasps> taken into consideration and not just run into the tree you're trying to get to. And we were talking about that earlier today where, but I think what you were saying was it also comes with experience and trusting yes. yourself, yes. which is what uh, I wasn't able to do last a year. A lot of people don't, they yeah. second guess themselves. And, you know, you're usually your first choice, you know, I find is your best choice most right. of the time. When you start second guessing, you know, you, you start doubting yourself and that's when, you know, things never seem to go well. You know, right. you got to have no, you just got to know it when you see it. You know, you got your, like you said, your tree picked out. I mean, I'm guilty of it as well. Going out into the marsh, I'm like, I'm going to go out and hunt that tree. Then come across, you know, an active scrape coming out as one. It's like, I've never seen a buck come out of there. And I'll bypass it. And it's right. like, I get to my tree and I don't see nothing. It's like, I should have hunted that scrape. Oh, that's exactly yeah. what happened. And it's me. like, yeah. and I know better, but you get so focused i think on, on you know a certain method or a tree or a sign you've seen last year you know but for me being being able to interpret hot sign uh, interpret hot sign uh mature buck hot sign is different you know right. scrapes kind of eh, but if you get like big tracks you know big tracks is important right big tracks usually means a big body right whether that is 120 inches or 180 inches that's you don't really know but big body is comes with age <laughs> right so, age we all know is one of the main driving factors of you know, antler growth or antler so if, po- if, potential if if you're going into an area and you, you got big tracks that are contradicting what your you know where your your stand might be you know you got to stop and think all right, why is this track here? And, and is it heading in this direction? Maybe is he, is he looping into this bedding area? Is he cruising? You know, is that track just in the middle open field, you know, or is it where a buck might come in or out a, a, a section, you know, uh, right. uh, some cover. So you got to be able to look at that sign that say, we'll go with tracks. Mm-hmm. And if it's going into thick cover and it's near where you want to be, Odds are that deer is probably bedded where you think he's bedded, you know. Right. But if it's fresh, and and you got to be able to age it too, because a lot of people will miss age tracks, you know. Right. It, and that comes with you know, experience. Years, yes. Yeah. You know, and with rubs and scrapes. Right. So, but hot for me, hot sign. I do my best to interpret it to where I'm going, because it might be hot sign, but you look at if if it's a field edge near near a parking lot. It's nighttime hot you sign. Have, so essentially what it is is that not all hot sign is created equal. Yes. Just like not all sign is created yeah, equal if you in got general. Hot, hot sign near a known doe bedding area in November, boom, you got your, you know, that's. Pretty good option. Yeah. You know, you know. early season, it's near some apples or or something along the lines. All right. That's a, a good option. But if it's in the middle of a field or a field edge where we all know nighttime <laughs> scraping activity is pretty 80 percent nighttime yeah and yeah. if you're going in the morning and you look down your flashlight and you got this you know scrape that's you can tell it's hit up you, you know, a few minutes ago you know and you know where that deer is possibly going you got a good chance to kill that deer that evening not that day right because <laughs> he's in that he's already in his bed already you know in bed, right or, or vice versa you're, you're coming out and you see 
right. sign coming out, out, out say into uh, a bean field, there's a scrape. Well, there's sign going out, and you know you, you got a tree back over here because you were hunting somewhere else. Then you, you might want to hunt, you know, your other location that right. you got, might have picked out. And, and it's interesting because you know, doing this podcast i've had the fortune of talking to a lot of good hunters you know and the one thing that's always i've noticed that's held true with guys who hunt mature deer and have success hunting mature deer is that no they don't none of them rate specific pieces of hot sign equally Mm -hmm. with one another right like so for example you know um john eberhardt big scrape big scrape guy you know what i mean um you have some guys who are big big rub guys you know what i mean um but the one thing that has been consistent is they all have give credence to a big track. Yes. Like that's the one like consistency. It's like you find that a Trump big track, <laughs> you find a big, you find a big deer. Right. Yep. And so then it becomes like, what are the pieces of secondary sign for you that are yes. important? Right. And what do you find? Right. Cause like, as you're mentioning, like that scrape that you just come across, depending on where it's at might be good. Yes. Right. If it's, as you said, near a field edge, probably not worth the time of day. Yeah. But if you're near a field edge and there's a bunch of thick stuff and you find a primary scraping area that has like six scrapes yeah. within like a 10 yard radius yeah. and like you know, a handful yard, of rubs. Yeah, 100 yards back off the field edge, you got something. You got something to work with there. You know what I mean? And so that's, I think, where interpreting hot sign. So it's not hot sign for hot sign's sake. Yes. You know what and, I mean? And for me, like I'm, uh, like I said, I'm primarily a bed hunter. So if I find hot sign like at a food source, usually it goes in one ear or out the other. Right. Um, because I don't necessarily hunt up or set up for food sources, right? You know, and I've f- fallen guilty. Oh, at least rub on a field edge. I'm gonna stay here and I'll see squat because it's a field right. edge, right? And it's a heavy pressure state. And I know better. Right. And, you know, that last 30 minutes, you're like, it's gonna happen, and nothing ever happens nothing. for me, right. right? You know, so if I find hot sign um, on field edge for the most part, I just leave it be, you know, right. unless it's I know that it's if it's entrance going into a bed that might be you know you know nearby he might be you know, posted up off this you know field a couple hundred yards i got a uh, a bed or a possible bedding area right and if i see that all right odds are he's probably coming out of that bed because the other the other buck bedding i found is you know 300 yards this way why would he be going into the woods this way you know right and you know and that just comes with you know trusting your gut and and taking a chance yeah. you know um waiting you know, is is going to kill you basically. You know, or hesitation and waiting. If you you wait to hunt, hot sign. Or sometimes you you've waited too long. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, if you wait to hunt a perfect spot, you know, and you're bypassing hot sign. You know, trying to get to this other spot. You know, you, you you're hesitating and waiting. So right. It, it's definitely uh, it's a coin toss. You know, but you have to take in consideration in, in the equation. You know, right. Unless you know for a fact that, you know, because especially for me, I don't run a lot of cameras, you know, in, in spots I'm hunting that year. So tracks are very important to me. Right. Because you know, I know I got my, my bedding areas you know, already mapped out. Usually my scraping or rub lines are already on my Onyx maps. Like I know all right. that stuff. And if I cut a track, you know, going in, I'm, I want to hunt this back piece of property. And I'm getting a lot of big rubs or big tracks in the front. You know, I've scouted enough. I know that there might, you know, there is a bedding area closer to the thing. So he's bedded there for some reason, be it pressure or food or whatever. So whatever. I'm like, yeah. all right, I'm going to backtrack. And I'm going to go, you know, or tomorrow I'm going to hunt this this evening bed over here. Right, right. You know? And like, not to beat a dead horse, but it's like, like we said, you know, not all sign is created equal. And I'm sure there's someone out there listening because like, we're, you know, I, you and I are of the same mind. If I find something that looks interesting along a food source yeah. in Pennsylvania, I'm probably not paying it much mind yeah. only other than to know that there's a, there's a buck around. Yes. Right. And even if I found a good track along a food source, all that's telling me is that there's a good buck around not yeah. hunting him, not hunting him there. Yeah. Right. You go to some places and Aaron, I don't think would, I don't want to speak for him, but like those dudes don't hunt a ton of food sources. Yeah. Right. But I've watched some of their videos where they do get on a food yeah. source on a piece of public where yeah. they found really good yeah. sign. That's maybe a low pressure, maybe it's Iowa. That's a low yeah. pressure state. Right. It, it's different in different places. Yeah. You know, if you got I mean? private, you know, some of that stuff don't necessarily come into play because, you know, I'm strictly a public land hunter. You right. Know? So my methods are, you know, private guys probably listen to this, you know, their heads are exploding. Right. Because, they see something different, you know, than I see, be, but different 
areas and different, you know, methods and it's, it's pressure. Why, <laughs> right. It's why when you say you have to interpret it, it's yeah. like, what does it mean for the specific location you're hunting? Yes. You know, you know what I mean? If you're hunting, you know, unpressured private land, you got 1,500 acres and it's managed, you know, un- unpressured, you know, hot sign's a lot different than, you know, pu- heavily, you know, pressured public land or even heavily pressured, you know, private land. Cause there's some private lands that get, you know, a shit ton of you know, pressure on it. Oh yeah, I mean the yeah. private land that we have back home, like the not not our most recent one, not the smaller piece, but like the larger farm that we have, like it hunts like public land, yep. just because of the amount of guys that yep. that hunt it and the adjacent pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just it's it's the same as hunting, and it's it's a little less. I don't want to put it in the same category, but it's not what you would think of when you think of hunting private yeah. private land. So on that piece, I would give zero credence to most sign that I find yeah. around a food source other than to know that there are bucks in the yeah. area. And if I found a good track that there was a buck here, and then I would look at going back to reading Topo, like we've yeah. talked about, I'd go back and say, okay, well, how did he get here? Yes. You know what I mean? What's the most logical way for him to get here? What's the easiest way for him to get here? Because yeah. that's likely what he used. And then backtracking and say, okay, what's the most logical place for him to be betting if this is where he's traveling? Yes. And yep. then where are my interception points at? Yeah, and hot sign too goes with food. You know, if you got that's a form of a hot sign. Yeah, you got apples. That it's not just the stuff that deer are making. Yes, right. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, you got apples. You got persimmons. You got oaks. When you know oaks are dropping, if you if I cut tracks, you know, in a little oak flat near bedding, I'll go get as close to that bedding as possible, and you know, hopefully I don't you know spook him getting in there because I know he's still going to come to. They're obviously feeding on these oaks. So I'll right. get a little aggressive on the bed. I know where he's bedded. You know, it's not necessarily rut sign or anything, but right. food sign trumps everything, you know, right. even during the rut, you know. Right, right. Because <laughs> you got the does. You know, hot yep. sign could be does. You see a, a big, you know, bunch of does cutting this, you know, cutting across those fields for some reason. They're they're heading in a direction for, for something. Right, you know? yeah. So, all right, I think we covered uh, covered the hot sign issue here pretty thoroughly, and so we're going to go ahead and shut this one down. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank Greg and Wilson for joining today, and also like to thank all of you for listening. If you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating, and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. We'd be super appreciative if you do those two things for us. And before we shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout-out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Small Green Rock, November's on my heels, makes me proud, makes me steal. Special knowing to call a phone. Image tape.